All right. So we talked about why people hated Dungeons & Dragons 4th Ed. Let's talk about why you should love it. <laughs> why I love it, maybe. Um, yeah, hi. Namaste, Mother Nuggets. Hopefully this is a second video. We'll see. We'll see how long we go. I'll try not to ramble. Um, which, you know, is, is my weakness. <laughs> so apologies in advance, but we'll give it a go. All right. Dungeons & Dragons 4th Ed. Why should you like it? So I didn't mean to shake everything there. Let's take a quick look. So, uh, as I said in the last video, I think, for me, the reason why I love it so much is that you have, a, like, you have so many more options of things to do in combat, right? Like, in, in the actual gameplay, right? Like, let's think about D&D. We all like to think about D&D. We all like to do whatever. When are you rolling dice? Almost always, you're rolling dice for combat when are you telling stories it's always you know when you tell people oh well, this is what happened it's either a really long rambling story that no one really cares about people pretend to listen to uh, you know <laughs> like yeah 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 cool you had like this whole big thing that happened um or it's either times you make a mess up where you like you know, have a big problem or it's times where you're fighting like the, the big bad guy and this is what happened and they did that. And so this sort of um, stuff gives you cool stuff you can do in the game, right? Um, and if you want to see an example of this, watch some um, Critical Role and then watch some Acquisitions Incorporated or listen to the podcast of Acquisitions Incorporated and kind of particularly the older ones, right? When they're first kind of getting into the system. Those first level, couple of levels, you know, where these things that 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 is what is happening, right? Think look at how much more combat is happening in 4th ed versus 5th ed podcasts, right? Um, you, you might as well just do collaborative storytelling, you know, if, if that's really what you're what you're into. You don't need a game system if that's what you're going to do, you know what I mean? Like, the game system is there, uh, you know, you might as well just sit around and tell a story. Uh, but in this case, the game system is exciting. The system itself, the things you can do, look at that, deadly payback, lion of battle, like these are the cool things you can do, the cool abilities you can get as you go. Um, and, you know, often it is about that, like, you know, tactically, you know, do I Eldritch Blast every turn? Or what else do I have that's going on? Um, and the other thing that I like that, you know, you know what? No other class, uh, no other version of D&D really has got uh, this right. One of my favorite characters to play in this game, if I can find it, it's not looking good though, is a, a Warlord, right? Um, like, how how do you do a Warlord in 3rd Ed or 5th Ed D&D? Right? Like, how do you make a character who their sole build is to help others be better? To bring a team together and, and really make that work, right? Fourth Ed had that. The Warlord has an ability, uh, you know, has these abilities. They're, you know, there's you can be inspiring, you can be tactical. Um, they're giving other people extra turns. They're giving them the ability to heal. They're giving them the ability to make saves. Um, you know, they're giving them the ability to make their attacks better. Wolfpack tactics, right? You know, yeah, you're doing this damage. You and your friends surround the enemy. Before you attack, let one ally adjacent either to you or the target shift one square as a free action. You're helping them position around, um, you know. Uh, guarding attack. You do two strength modifier damage until the end of your next turn. One adjacent ally to you or the target gains plus two bonus to the AC. So, you know, you're doing these things. And if you have the right feat, then the power bonus equals your charisma modifier instead of plus two. So, you know, just, uh, you know, your this kind of character build is the thing that is interesting. And whilst I picked the Warlord to highlight this... Uh, you know, every class has this. You can build every class as a way that's, you know, assisting others. That's it's making it more of a team game. So a lot of the time in 3rd Ed and 5th Ed, when I'm talking about combat or listening to players talk about combat, it's like, do we do this? Do we do that? How do we deal the most damage? Okay, let's move on next, right? Like, they don't really care about, it's like, that, right? Or they're talking about other things that's not part of the combat. They're talking about being outside of the game. They're not really, maybe they're on their phone, they're not really paying attention 
attention. In fourth ed, that never happened because all the conversation, it was about the the moment. You were in the moment because, you know, there were different ways you could put things. Oh, okay, if I do this thing this round, then that'll be a problem. Oh, wait, if you do that thing this round, I've marked him. So if anyone else attacks that enemy... Then they're gonna lose the bonuses because I need to. They need to be dealing damage to me, right? Like you're like holding threat if you're familiar with that sort of wow concept, you know, like or or, or whatever. Like it mattered. The choices you made mattered, uh, and often the order in which you did things mattered. Um, and so that's that's for me one of the things that I I love about this game is you've you know you've got these. Um, stuff and you still have. You know, this is the first one that kind of reduced all the skills down. You still have all your skill checks and stuff like that. In fact, I think it has a little bit more than the 5th Ed one does now because they got rid of a lot of it. And you have your feats and things like that. And, um, you know, just like the previous, you know, it's given you all sorts of things. Multiclassing in this is interesting. I don't know how they multiclass in 5th Ed. Um, but and if, in 3rd Ed, it was just you, you take extra levels in the class and basically make yourself a weaker version of both of those characters combined together. In this one, you're like, okay, I'm going to multiclass and you get some of the skill levels and... and um, special abilities that they get depending upon uh what one you do and it's taken as like a feat um and so you can you know pick up some spells here and there you can pick up um you know all those other sorts of things magic weapons in this were a bit interesting uh magic items and you can see what's this the magic items in the player's handbook yes because you know it was you know because they have these powers the items themselves give you powers and stuff like it became part of your character build that you know you would look into how you could um sort of you know it gives you extra at will actions and and power daily actions and encounter actions and things like that um which you know it, it, you know it, in terms of the action economy this is the game that really kind of made it matter um you know because your actions actually did matter right and as you can see it's all quite um yeah, and you've got different levels as well. So, again, this is people were like, oh, it's like, you know, Diablo. It was like, wow, you got to get your grind and get your better gear. But, you know, in this case, it gives us... It, it's good because, you know, in 5th Ed, we hear a lot of, like, basically no one has any magic weapons ever because, oh, the magic... Your plus one sword will break the game. And it's like, well, the plus one sword only breaks the game if you let it, first of all. But secondly, uh, you know, if you're in a world where, okay, everyone's got a plus one sword at level two... You know, that is, you know, the side or level four. By level five, everyone's got something cool that they have. And I think that's the other part of this is it kind of really, as a GM for me, uh, made me consider, like, how, what kind of treasures am I giving my players? And am I making sure that their needs are met by those treasures, right? It's cool for me to just randomly throw a plus one armor or here or, you know, magic wand there or whatever. But when I played this, I, I thought about what is every character wanting out of their out of their stuff and that's kind of the way i've approached giving treasure out since then as well even when i write my adventures like i try to think can i put something in for every kind of archetype of class you know the mage the thief the whatever just so that they're getting their needs met um and so fourth ed definitely encouraged that a lot better i think that's the player handbook thing um but I wanted to talk... The other reason I like this game, it's not just about that. It's about what the DM does as well. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the DM's guide has very extensive rules for building um, dungeons, random dungeons and random encounters. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that you can do this. One of them is very similar to kind of the third ed way. It doesn't have the kind of campaign randomization that we you know we've seen in the joy of wargaming videos and you know the, those kinds of first ed um you know where you are exploring and doing that While, whilst i love that i wish that it did have that it does not have that kind of fully developed sort of randomized system um but the the actual dungeon system is actually very very well made right um, it also has the encounter, random encounters, very well made. Um, but it talks about trying to do it playing without a GM. You might seem a bit strange for advice for a dungeon master's guide, but it's entirely possible to play D and D without a dungeon master. If you are all looking, if all you're looking for is fun and exciting combat with no more than the barest hint of plot and purpose, a random dungeon with random encounter deck is all you need. Someone needs to prepare a deck, and someone needs to run the monsters through the game. They does they doesn't need to be the same person. Uh, that's a great. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> typo there. All the players can decide together what monsters do and let the players, uh, who the players target of attack, make the attack roll, or have the person left for the monsters. So, you like, you know, basically each person rolls for the monsters that are attacking, you know, the, the next person. A random dungeon with no DM makes for good ways to spend the game session when your regular DM can't play. It's also a fun activity over lunch hour as long as your school or office is forgiving of a group of people rolling dice and shouting battle cries. Um, but yeah, you basically what it says is it says, okay, well, decide what level you want and then you're going to generate the monsters within this. They've also got Monster Mix and this is yet another thing that I wanted to talk about about how great 4th Ed is. Uh, the way once as well, look at that. We got some... Uh, We've got some previous play information, but there you go. So, um, yeah, like, you've got your, your monsters have roles, right? And it actually talks about it at the start, kind of, um, tells you, you know, like, what is their, what is their job? What kind of things should they be doing? Um, I think that's in the DM guide, actually, where it tells you, like, these are the different ways. And you have these kind of themed characters as well. Like, if we just go for a, a goblin, let's see if I can find myself a goblin. Perfect. So, you have, like, your crappy little goblin, you've got, like, you know, a sneaky goblin, and each one of them has a role. So, a minion, in this, in 4th Ed, minions are, like, they've got one hit point. They're harder to hit, their AC is, like, way harder, but when you hit them, they're just dead, right? Lurkers, they're a bit more tricky, they're kind of skirmishy. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're also hard to hit, right? But again, they've got quite low health, um, like quite low HP uh, for what they are. Um, they're enough to survive a few hits. And then you've got kind of you know your warriors, your skirmishers. You've got artillery, the guys who were meant to stay back. A controller, someone who's you know giving, like I said, that warlord. They've got that. They're, they're adding things to it. Um, you know, you've got a brute. You know, these big elite monsters. Now, I've always done that with third ed. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I when I run third ed and stuff, I've always had um, you know I always try to beef up the things. I've never really kept the stats as good as you know as straightforward as they as they should be. An elite controller, like an elite boss. The other thing that you have with these is they do have rechargeable abilities, right? So like the idea that you know you're rolling to see if they recharge. So they've got cool things to do. Uh, so they're not just going, I attack, I attack, I attack every turn, right? Um, and this is particularly true of the more challenging um, guys and the, and the spellcasty guys, right? So you, when you're making your random dungeon, you, you, you make a deck of cards or you make a list of characters or whatever, um, and you, 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 you know, have the, those different abilities kind of stretched out throughout the deck, so you have kind of whatever. And the same for their level, right? Like, you're keeping it in mind, you're keeping what your level is. Once you've built the deck, it's very easy to do that. Now, there is a there is a couple of ways that you can kind of get around doing that. Instead of making the list, you can, like, making an actual deck or whatever, you can just, um, you know, not just pick them, but, like, you know, alter their stats a little bit. Get, take a base template. If it's this, it's this. If it's that, it's that. Kind of steal ideas from what the DM guide has said, the, the Monster Manual has said. The other thing you can do about the random dungeons, instead of using the book to generate it, like this, they had a bunch of board games. One was called Wrath of a Shardalon. One was called Legend of Deuce. There was a Castle Ravenloft one. And it was a game in itself, which was pretty cool, and you would kind of explore. And as you explore, um, you know, you're coming across these, these dungeons... And you go through, and like, you know, as you get to the edge, you just put the little thing there. You've got some blast markers, whatever. So you go around the corner. You've got some, you know, nice and easy. You generate your stuff. Oh, look at this. We've got like, uh, let's say there is a, you know, this one, it makes it a bigger room. So you can build on, and you can see, oh, that now becomes a cupboard, but what are you going to do? Right? And they had these chambers, which kind of had like four or six tiles where, you know, you can build bigger chambers and stuff like that. Um, if it had, uh, let's see, do I have one with a white tile? If it has a white tile, then, you know, you're, you're drawing a, a card or, or whatever. So you can incorporate this board game into doing some solo D&D runs, um, you know, sort of for yourself. Build these dungeons out. And as you can see, they're kind of scaled correctly so that, you know, if you want to use your Warhammer minis or whatever... There they are, right? Like, you can just chuck them down and give, give it a game. Um, so, that's another way that you can do it. And that's kind of what we'll be doing, I think, when we do the solo. I don't know if I can do it that way uh, as much. But definitely, 
you know, cause just cause I don't have the space to lay it out. It is fun to do that. And I have done that with groups as well. Like not just, I will be a GM, but I'll also be a player at the same time and, and do it like that. Um, and so you can set up these, uh, sort of random, random things and still have it be a very rewarding experience. Right. And now in this case, it kind of dismisses it. Like, you know, if all you want to do if all you're looking for is the fun of exciting combat with no more than the barest hint of plot or purpose, a random dungeon and random encounter deck is all you need, right? Like, they're kind of very dismissive of that. But I think because... Like, if, if you were to do this with 3rd Ed or 5th Ed, it doesn't work, right? Because the combat itself is boring, right? In, in those games. But because... Oh, that was not a good noise, was it? Because in... In 4th Ed, the combat is its exciting. It is thoughtful. It is tactical. Uh, that is what makes the game work, right? And that is what makes those kind of random things work. And sure, we can use those other tools if we want to. We can go back to 1st Ed and 2nd Ed and use those story generation tools. We can get Scarlet Heroes out and use that to generate our story. You know, we can get those other tables if we really want that, that lore, um, you know, we can delve into that if we, if we so choose, but if we just want to, um, you know, if we, if we want to do some dungeon crawling, uh, and make stories a, along the way, then, you know, this is a perfect example of, of how to, how to do that. It still has the normal wilderness encounters. It still has those sorts of things. You can roll those off and, you know, have, have those be what guides your story, um, you know, and maybe the story is more about treasure hunting rather than about, you know, these big sweeping, you know, plot arcs, which, you know, we see in other things. But uh, I just wanted to share my love of that. And it's if you are going to put in the effort of actually running a story and narrating games and things like that, uh, it works great. It works amazingly. Like if you have a GM and the GM is going to be pushing those storylines and doing all that theater kid stuff that we all love. Uh, you know, then that makes the game even more better because it, it means that when you get to, you know, when you get to combat, if you're playing, okay, so when I'm playing a, a normal D&D, I like to be those kinds of characters. I like to have those kinds of storylines where I'm like, yeah, my character's a noble, but he's run away from his family and uh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, I like all that extra roleplay stuff. That is, like, why I do roleplaying because I love the storytelling side of things. Um, but then it gets to combat and I'm like, well, unfortunately my shitty noble can't really do anything that contributes in a useful way, right? Let's flip that. I'm a noble. I'm a, I'm, I want to be a leader. I'm out here trying to prove myself, you know, as, as a young leader, taking this group of, uh, you know, uh, my, my soldiers off to go and, you know, do whatever. Guess what? I'm a warlord. I can help them. When I'm in combat, I am able to motivate them. I am able to give an inspiring speech that causes them to gain some hit points or get better attacks on their rolls. I'm not just, a, you know, a fighter with a high charisma score. I'm actually someone that makes a difference. Uh, and that, I think, that suddenly means that the combat is exciting, which for even the most role play theatre kid in the group... And that means that all of a sudden now we are role-playing in combat as well as role-playing outside of combat and so it creates something that's very special in my opinion anyway that's my rant <laughs> i hope it wasn't too rambly um i would like to do some of this uh we'll see if i can get the time to actually set it up and work out how we're going to make it story and interesting for everybody uh, i don't think i have the room for these boards but we'll, we will see what we can what we can come up with um, but yeah, if you have any comments of your own about why you like or dislike D&D, if you disagree with anything I say, please chuck it in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Uh, and that is the end of the video. Ciao for now. I'll try and get some actual gaming done next time. <laughs> See you guys.